down, down they go. Into the darkness of the grave, gently they go. The beautiful, the tender, the kind. Quietly they go. The intelligent, the witty, the brave. I know, but I do not approve. And I am not resigned. In 1951, a woman died in Baltimore, in America. She was called Henrietta Lacks. These are cells from her body. They were taken from her just before she died. They have been growing and multiplying ever since. There are now billions of these cells in laboratories around the world. If massed together, they would weigh 400 times her original weight. These cells have transformed modern medicine but they also became caught up in the politics of our age. They shaped the policies of countries and of presidents. They even became involved in the Cold War. Because scientists were convinced that in her cells lay the secret of how to conquer death. In 1860, a plantation owner in Virginia, called Benjamin Lax, took a black mistress from among his workers. She bore him two children. They took their father's name, and for three generations, the Lax family worked in the fields. Then, in 1942, his great-granddaughter, Henrietta Lax, decided to move to the city. She took her husband and family to Baltimore. It was wartime, and there was money to be made. She was known to all her friends as Henny. Oh, my goodness. I don't think I could top her. Henny was a beautiful girl. I was beautiful myself. I called myself back in them days. But Henny was very, very pretty. Beautiful face, round face. And I used to mar her dressing because she used to dress real fancy. I dressed good, too. But she had a husband, and she could fold fine dressing. And she liked pretty things. She likes nice things. The cells stop growing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes something happens to start them growing again, uncontrolled, dividing again, outlaws. Pressing on healthy tissues, healthy organs, growing, spreading throughout the body to start new malignant colonies. is cancer. Six miles away from where Henrietta lived was the laboratory of Dr. George Guy. Dr. Guy's ambition was to rid the world of cancer. He was convinced that the secret of how to do this lay inside the human cell. For 20 years, he had been trying to grow human cells in test tubes. Dr. Guy's simple dream was to be the first to successfully sustain the growth of human cells outside the body so that in test tubes the secret of cancer cause could be exposed and once exposed altered and corrected the key dr guy believed was to feed the cells on chicken blood he did this by drawing blood from the heart of live chickens he then mixed it with cancer tissue taken from patients in Baltimore's main hospital. His aim was to persuade the cancer cells to keep growing outside the body. Each time he filmed the results, but every attempt failed. After a few days, the cells always died. Then, on February the 1st, 1951, Henrietta Lacks was taken to Baltimore's main hospital. She had been sent to see a gynecologist. I just happened to be the one who saw her uh, when she first came in. And her um, history was very simple. She had had some intermenstrual spotting and, and bleeding, which uh, is a sign of cancer, but it can be a sign of other things too. She was generally fine. There was no difficulty with the general examination. But on examination of the cervix by the eye, with a suitable instrument. I was extremely 
um, impressed, and I can see that lesion today because it was not like an ordinary cancer. This was different. This didn't look like cancer. It was purple, and it bled very easily on touching. I'd never seen anything that looked like it, and I don't think I've ever seen anything look like it since. So it was a very special, different kind of, of what turned out to be a tumor. Cancer? As usual, a small piece of the cancerous tissue was cut off and taken to Dr. Guy. I was eating lunch. We always ate lunch right in the laboratory next to the mouse cages. And a doctor guy came in with a Petri dish and he said that there was a specimen to put into culture. And what he had left me was a chunk of tumor tissue. And I took my scalpels like this. These were sterile and the tissue would be in a Petri dish like this. And you just cut it up just like you're cutting up some meat. And then you add it according to his formula, so many drops of chicken plasma, just like I had done all the others. And lo and behold, it grew. Henrietta Lacks's cells began to do what Guy had dreamed of. They started to grow in his laboratory. This is the film he took of their first week's growth. Henrietta was sick. She was sick. You could hear her sometime all the way downstairs, Holly. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I can't get no ease. The stomach would be hurting her so bad. Jesus, help me. Help me. I didn't never hear nobody say that she had cancer. Nobody. You know, that was a secret word one time. If people had cancer, they didn't talk about it. They didn't talk about it. They was afraid. These are Henrietta Lacks's cells filmed six weeks later. Each cell is now dividing every 20 hours. For any cancer, it was a record growth rate. The cells exhibited the same growth in the test tube as they exhibited in her, namely that they were unstoppable and continued to grow in a very special way. So it was the first human cell line. Her tumor, incidentally, did not respond well to treatment. Henrietta Lacks died on October the 4th, 1951. Tonight, we will learn why scientists believe that cancer can be conquered. That same evening, Dr. Guy appeared on a television science program to show off his breakthrough. Now let me show you a bottle in which we have grown massive quantities of cancer cells. As he held Henrietta Lacks's cells up to the camera, his assistant was in the autopsy room. Dr. Guy had sent her to get more of the precious cells from the dead body. And I was all alone with my Petri dish, and I walked in, and she was all completely open. Um, and just, you could look in and see tumor everywhere on all the tissues, and her bladder was one complete solid mass of tumor. We will show you some actual pictures of colonies in a test tube of cancer cells such as those I just showed you. It is quite possible that from us fundamental studies such as these, that we will be able to learn a way by which cancer can be completely wiped out Henrietta Lacks's body was taken back south to be buried. Dr. Guy kept what he had done a secret from her family. He was worried they might sue him. He gave the cells a code name, HeLa, H-E-L-A, and told everyone they came from a woman called Helen Lane. Henrietta Lacks was forgotten by science, but her cells were about to become world famous. For the first time, anything could be tested on living human cells. Her cells were sent into space, accompanied by two white mice. The aim was to find out what would happen to human flesh in zero gravity. Cosmetic companies bought millions of her cells to test for possible side effects in their new products. The American military placed large flasks of HeLa cells next to atomic tests. They wanted to see what the effects of radiation would be on human tissue. And then came polio. 
HeLa cells were the perfect host on which to grow and study the polio virus. From this came the development of the vaccine that conquered the disease. And polio raised a further question. Might cancer too be caused by a virus? And if it was, could it too be cured? It was hoped in the 50s that a virus could be discovered that had been a major cause of cancer and a vaccine developed to that virus to control cancer. And because Henrietta Lacks' cells were cancerous, they had to have the secret of what cancer was and how you could kill it. The first step was to find out whether, like polio, cancer was infectious. Two scientists went to a maximum security prison in Ohio. They took with them large quantities of Henrietta Lacks' cells. Well, this is the first suspension that we'll be using this morning. And down at the bottom here, you can see quite a pellet of concentrated cancer cells. This material, the suspension of cells, will then be taken up into a tuberculin syringe and merely injected underneath the skin of the forearm through an area that has been anesthetized with Novocaine. They were inoculating them with HeLa cells under the skin to see if the HeLa cells would uh, grow and, and uh, cause a cancer. It seemed a very eminently reasonable thing to do. How else are you going to find out if, if uh, HeLa cells, in fact, do, uh, you know, spread and cause cancer? Well, now, why did you volunteer for this? My uh, grandmother, my father, both died of cancer. And I believe that the uh, wrong that I have done in the eyes of society might, uh, this might make a right on it. I, mean, I don't know. Some of the prisoners developed small tumors, but not full-blown cancer. The results were inconclusive. Then they cut out the lower one on my arm, as you see here. The top one, they called me back after 14 days, and it did not have to be removed. It had died out in my system. So that is, uh, they think that there is, there is, but they're trying to find immunity to it. But then other evidence emerged that seemed to prove there really might be a cancer virus. Henrietta Lacks was no longer alone in the cell world. Suddenly it seemed very easy to grow cells outside the body. Some were cancerous, others were normal. This is a heart cell growing inside a Petri dish. Each cell is beating with the same rhythm as the heart from which it came. Out of this original push, attempts now proliferated everywhere to grow human cells, and many of them were successful. By God, they had cells from lung, and they had cells suddenly growing and rapidly from, from a variety, a whole spectrum of human tissues. I had prostate surgery, and um, since the prostate grows so well in the body, I thought, well, it should be able to grow pretty well in our laboratory. So I made arrangements to have the surgeon cut off a piece of the prostate that it's removed, mince it up with scissors, very fine, sharp scissors, in a sterile glass vessel. Because the finer you mince, the better, you ha the better chance you have of getting a better yield of cells. In the hunt to start new cell lines, other cell biologists turned to their own families. I decided that I would try to establish a cell line from the amnion at the birth of one of my children. And on the day of my daughter's birth, I appeared with my wife and the collecting materials, which I gave to the nurse. And the material was duly collected. I took it back to the laboratory after assuring myself that my wife and new daughter were, were healthy. And within a few hours, I could look through the microscope and see the cells from my daughter's amnion. Then the strangest thing began to happen. Many of the normal cell lines suddenly developed cancer. Normal cells lying open in the laboratory would abruptly transform into malignant cancer cells. It became known as spontaneous transformation. I observed in the culture an island of cells that looked different from the, uh, from the, the normal cell population. And because of my experience with cells by that time, I knew that this was what we then called a spontaneous transformation. That is, the spontaneous acquisition of cancer cell properties by a normal cell in culture. 
there was now a growing belief that inside malignant cell lines like Henrietta Lacks's was a cancer virus. If it could be found and isolated, cancer would be conquered. But it was going to take a great deal of money. Help came from a woman called Mary Lasker. She was a millionaire society hostess in New York. I think this is one of the most exciting still lifes that Matisse ever did. It's full of color and warmth. I have some pictures here by Cezanne and Manet and Renoir. Lasker's husband had died of cancer. Since then, she had devoted herself to a crusade. She wanted the government to fund a vast project, like the space program, to cure cancer. Believe it or not, uh, the amount of money uh, that's being spent for medical research is, well, it's just fiddling. And you won't believe this, less is spent on, on cancer research than we spend on chewing gum. But cancer was low on the political agenda. To persuade the politicians, Mary Lasker needed to find the promise of a simple cure. Then one of her scientist friends, Matilda Krim, told her about the virus cancer theory. To Mary Lasker, the virus theory of cancer was very exciting when she heard of it. It seemed to offer a point of attack to the cancer problem, you know. Uh, knowing the enemy is always useful. She called me one day and she says, Matilda, we have to push this uh, campaign for cancer research because this is something the public will be in favor of. Everybody's afraid of cancer. We together started this campaign for cancer research. I'm Bing Crosby, and I am on stage. And that means the show's begun. Lasker and Krim turned to Hollywood. They persuaded the stars to appear in network television shows. Their job was to speak publicly about the thing of which everyone was terrified. Today, I'm 53 years old. I have a family consisting of six kids and a wife whom I adore. And I also have lung cancer. You are nobody till somebody loves you. Their other task was to broadcast the confident promises of the scientists. It is my belief that we are now witnessing the beginning of a great explosion of knowledge about this disease, which will culminate in its complete control. Even if I'm gone when you see me speak these words to you, let me join you in this crusade, and let's make this world a world that's cancer-free. But at the very moment when the stars were promising the end of cancer, the cell biologists realized there was something seriously wrong with their science. And the reason was Henrietta Lacks and her cells. It began when a scientist called Stanley Gartler examined many of the major cell lines. He discovered that all of them secreted the same form of enzyme. It was a type found only in black people. The problem was that all the cell lines he looked at came from whites. The only black cell line was Henrietta Lacks. At a packed meeting of cell biologists, Gartler announced the inescapable conclusion. He told them, folks, uh, cell lines that are presumably derived from other tissues in different individuals are not such. These are cells from Henrietta Lacks. If you think you have been working with breast cells, you're wrong. If you think you've been working with lung cells, you're wrong, and kidney cells, you're wrong. You're working with cells derived from a human female uterus, and that's that. And it was very embarrassing, and it was very shocking to many people, and there was, there was a great alarm. I couldn't believe it. He was saying that this enzyme is present only among blacks. So, ergo, this tissue it did not come from you. You're white. It must have come from black. If it came from black, it probably came from HeLa. So you mixed your cells with HeLa. Whether it's, I say he's wrong, I, I say he's wrong. Many of the cell biologists refused to believe Gartler. But for those who had developed cell lines from their own flesh and blood, the only other explanation was even worse. 
what Gartler was uh, saying about my daughter's cells was that they were, had uh, enzyme characteristics of a black parent, which is the reason I ran to the telephone to speak with my wife. And she assured me that I had nothing to worry about. I'm not black and neither is my wife. Leonard Hayflick never, he never believed what he was hearing. In his particular case, because it involved his own blood, his own cells. It involved, really, to get down to a cellular level, it involved his own sperm and that of the egg of his wife. To me, it had absolutely no importance whatsoever, other than my uh, intellectual curiosity. Bogus, it was, um, it was uh, a scandal. It was, uh, to put it mildly, something terribly, terribly wrong. The problem was that no one fully understood how Henrietta Lacks's cells had contaminated the other cell lines. There was something wrong in cell biology, but no one knew how big or quite what the problem was. Meanwhile, Mary Lasker had succeeded with her campaign. She had got to the president. Mary Lasker made of cancer a subject to which politicians had to pay attention. Here, and she would go to, to the White House, either alone or as a guest at a big dinner, and so she pulled out her little notebook and she read the numbers to the president. How many dead, how many sick, how much it costs. And she would say to Johnson, in no time we're going to discover tumor-inducing viruses in humans, and we should have a vaccine against these viruses. You know, that's power and he performed perfectly. Someday I hope and I'm going to pray for that we will uh, find a cure for cancer. And uh, I, I want it done in my time. I want to play my part in it. I want to do something about it. The loneliest moment I ever had in my life was when I learned that my mother was gone from me uh, because of this uh, terrible uh, disease. Politicians now vied with each other to find a relative who had died of cancer. My favorite aunt, my aunt Elizabeth, died with cancer. When she was just 32 years of age. And she was a wonderful person for withering away with cancer. In 1971, Mary Lasker triumphed. She persuaded President Nixon to announce a national war on cancer. I will also ask for an appropriation of an extra $100 million to launch an intensive campaign to find a cure for cancer. And I will ask later for whatever additional funds can effectively be used. The time has come in America when the same kind of concentrated effort that split the atom and took man to the moon should be turned toward conquering this dread disease. The promise Nixon held out to the American people was an end to cancer. Millions of dollars were to be given to the scientists who promised they could find the cancer virus. It was the biggest medical research program ever organized. And at its heart were the cell lines. But those in charge of the cell lines knew there was a problem with contamination. They appointed a scientist, Walter Nelson Rees, to investigate just how bad the problem was. We began to probe and to investigate, um, purposely looking, not necessarily purposely looking for a mistake, but wanting to know the details of individual cells. And what did you begin to find? And what we began to find that was that many, many, many of these cell lines, I mean, eventually over 100 cell lines, were alike. And were alike to Gila. Nelson Rees discovered that Gila had a power unlike any other cell line. If just one Gila cell was dropped by mistake into another culture, or blown across the laboratory by a current of air, this cell would begin to grow and multiply faster than its host. It represented what cancer was dreaded for. 
A single cell has gone awry. It grows uncontrolled. And the problem was to become much worse. Nelson Rees discovered HeLa cells in places where it didn't seem possible. Building 41 was the most secure laboratory in the world. It had airlocks and a special ventilation system. It had been built to contain the deadly cancer virus when it was found. Nelson Rees examined a breast cell line being used inside the building. He was convinced it had been contaminated by HeLa, but this was impossible. HeLa cells had never been allowed inside Building 41. Walter Nelson Rees contacted me one day and said he had gotten this line from somebody who got it from me, and uh, he said uh, basically that they're HeLa cells, they're not breast cells at all. The reason I was so suspicious of its being HeLa cells is we didn't have HeLa cells in our lab, and I really couldn't see how it was possible. But HeLa had got into Building 41 in disguise. Other cell lines already contaminated had been brought in from outside. No one knew that these were infected by HeLa. But then Nelson Rees discovered something even more alarming. He examined what was believed to be the original stock of the breast cell line, HBT3. He found that even these were all HeLa. There had never been any breast cells at all. We had several freezes of HBT3, and we tested every one of them, and they were all HeLa cells. Uh, the inescapable conclusion is that the first cell that landed in that Petri dish to grow was a HeLa cell. So had you ever managed to grow a breast cell? No, sir. Never did. Um, kind of got out of the business very quickly after this happened. Why is she so powerful? That I can't answer. One just simply does not know what the constitution is of HeLa cells. One does not know what the constitution is, why it is that in spite of, 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 um, of insults, human insults, uh, insults in culture, temperature changes, letting them lie overnight on the counter without being incubated, there'll always be a HeLa cell growing. What Nelson Rees had discovered began to undermine the war on cancer. At its headquarters in the suburbs north of Washington, urgent meetings were held. If Nelson Rees was right, hundreds of the cell lines on which the whole program depended were contaminated. It meant that all the research done using these lines was suspect. Was he right? Of course he was right. And it, it turned out later. You know, when we took all the, all the cooperating laboratories and went back and looked at everything, uh, we found out it was right. How serious is that? Well, I would say that virtually all of the, the scientific conclusions that I've reached are worthless. It is devastating, ultimately, to have done, to have wasted three years, four years on the wrong cells. If your entire program was built upon the study of specifically what's going on in your cell system, you're working with the wrong cell line, it's, it's, it's comparable to thinking you're living in a palace and actually you're living in a cabin in a log cabin somewhere. It's not just that this culture was contaminated with HeLa, it's that the entire scientific community in one way or another is contaminated with the wrong information, with the wrong results, and with no advance. It was becoming clear that the scientists had completely misunderstood the evidence in front of their eyes. Some now began to question the original theory of spontaneous transformation. It said that cells spontaneously turned into cancer in the laboratory because of a virus. But maybe the cancer had not been caused by a virus. Maybe it had simply been a contamination by HeLa. Could this mean there was no such thing as the cancer virus? But then, the Russians found the cancer virus. In November 1972, an American delegation of scientists visited Moscow. The Russians told them that they had found the human cancer virus in five different cell lines. It was the breakthrough. Well, they were claiming they had discovered the human cancer virus that this was a human tumor virus growing in human cancer cells isolated from different organs. And uh, there were like five different laboratories 
in Moscow that had the similar claim. As simple as that. It's possible that the Russians had this, and they thought it's possible that they had it. Politically, it would have been a tremendous thing for them. It would have been a, a true, uh, uh, finally, it would have truly established them in the eyes of all the world. That indeed, they were the first to isolate a human tomb of ours, which we were looking for, which we were working toward all of these years of the virus cancer program. It was a proud moment for the Russians. They sent samples of the five cell lines to the Americans. All their visitors could offer in return was a box containing viruses that caused cancer in animals. National Institute of Health uh, USA. Uh, а в ней, а в ней вирусы животных, вирусы опухолей животных, все на которых производилось все исследования в то время. Это мышиные вирусы вот в этой коробке. Здесь вирусы кур, куриные вирусы. Как отзывались на на этот подарок? Очень хорошо. Ну прекрасно. Но это это ну вот это от сердца. The Americans immediately flew the Russian cells back to Washington. They were taken in great secrecy to the headquarters of the War on Cancer. Our purpose was to test their viruses and their cells for uh, the known viruses. There was evidence that the Russians had been correct, that there was a viral reverse transcriptase in the supernatants from these cells. So they had viruses? They did have viruses. But we, it was our job to confirm everything we had been told. So the cells were also examined to demonstrate that they were of human origin. This is when we sent them to Walter Nelson Reese. These cells were treated with kid gloves. This was a precious arrival of something extraordinary because something was showing up in these cells that was, that was um, new, novel, uh, exciting. And these cells were going to be handled very carefully, and only until they had been examined thoroughly was anything going to be said about them, done with them, sent to other people, or anything, God forbid, anything published on these particular cells, because this was a breakthrough. And sooner than not, the results came back, and all of these cell lines had type AG6PD, which meant to us that they were derived from black individuals, probably from a 20% of a black um, population. Now, I knew about Lumumba University. I knew that there was a large contingent of African blacks in Moscow. But you know, I just thought there's, there's something fishy here. It just can't be. So Nelson Reese examined the chromosomes of the Russian cells. He found they were all identical to Gila. It meant only one thing. Somehow, some of Henrietta Lacks's cells had got through the Iron Curtain. And the virus the Russians found turned out to be no more than a harmless monkey virus. She had picked it up on her journey to Moscow. Then the Russians arrived in Washington for their return visit. How did you go about telling them the bad news? <laughs> Were difficult as I recall, we, we had uh, one of the joint meetings of the uh, the two delegations in Bethesda. The Russian scientists on one side of the table, the Americans on the other side, and all this sort of thing. We even brought in the scientist Walter Nelson Reese, who had worked on this one cell line that they thought was a human tumor cell line producing product. It inadvertently became a national and international event because I was clearly blurting out the fact that this was one in the same cell line, albeit perhaps different cultures, of cells from Henrietta Lacks with the same identical virus growing on them and had nothing to do with some new discovery. And this is a slap in the face. Nelson Ries, он показал по хромосомам, по характерным хромосомам, и по характерному э, маркерному ферменту э, он смог идентифицировать линии, которые на самом деле являются хиля, так сказать, не соответствуют своему названию, на самом деле являются хиля. 
Ну, в общем, это уже сразу стало ясно, что э, и в Америке линии загрязнены во всем мире, и к нам они же пришли, они не у нас были выведены эти линии, они же тоже к нам пришли из Америки, из Европы. Наверное, отреагировали. Наверное, отреагировали. Наверное, отреагировали. Ну, может, старались не очень показывать это дело. Так, так. Не очень показывать. At a press conference, the Russians tried to put a brave face on events. Позвольте прежде всего поблагодарить правительство Соединенных Штатов за приглашение нашей делегации. But the news had leaked out although the Americans attempted to hush it up. Although we attempted to play it down considerably, the Russian episode was, a, was visible and newsworthy enough that it contributed to the increasing skepticism about the way the virus cancer program would find the human tumor virus. Another example of a failure for a claim to be upheld and as a result then people begin to believe there is no claim that will be upheld. By the mid-70s, those in charge of the war on cancer realized they were as far away as ever from understanding why cells became cancerous. Billions of dollars had been spent, but they had found no virus. And so political pressure and all of this sort of thing started building up. And, uh, and sooner or later, uh, it, they came to realize that, well, the virus cancer program isn't that great. You have not come across a human tumor virus yet, and you've been in business since 1964. The program died. I'm not saying it died a miserable death, it just disappeared. What had begun as a vast project to push back the boundaries of death had failed. The secret of what made human cells turn into cancer and grow and divide ceaselessly remained elusive. But the scientists and politicians had raised enormous expectations. They had turned cancer into a public enemy and promised to conquer it. And those expectations remained. The two million American men and women who are leading the fight against cancer I am not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts in the hard ground. So it is and so it will be. The best is lost. The honest look, the laughter, the love, they're gone. They're gone to feed the roses. I know, but I do not approve. And I am not resigned. But at this very moment of scientific despair, a new theory of how to conquer cancer emerged. And yet again, behind its rise to power, was Henrietta Lacks and her cells. It came from a new generation of scientists who believed that cancer was not caused by a virus from outside. It came from inside, from the genes. The genetic theory of the cause of cancer said that the enemy is within, it's in your genes. So from the very moment you're born, the bomb is ticking away inside of you. It's much more difficult, it's more insidious. Uh, we have to intervene within your own body. We have to be more intrusive. We can't keep it away. You had to probe and uncover the bad DNA. But up to this time, there had been no way of identifying particular genes. Then an English geneticist called Professor Harris found a way. Professor Harris fused uh, HeLa cells with a mouse cell. The, the resulting cells, the clones of cells that are then isolated, have different um, elements of the HeLa cell genetics. It allowed people to try to map genes to different chromosomes. And this was a fundamental tool in the development of gene mapping. Henrietta Lacks now became an object of fascination for geneticists. They wanted to know everything about her, not just her cells, but her entire genetic history. The problem was, she was dead. You couldn't study her genetics 
because she had died. So the only way to figure out what she was genetically, in terms of all these different markers, was to go back to her family. In 1976, a team of geneticists set out to track down the remaining members of the Lacks family. They found her husband and four of her children still living in Baltimore. I say it was about 15 or 20 years after she'd been dead, and uh, they wanted to do this genetic research to find out whether any of the kids carried her, the same uh, gene that she carried or whatever. So they wanted blood, so they came, and they asked permission to uh, draw blood from her children. A doctor and a nurse came to the house and had all of us there. The blood test they did on us, they took blood tests from each one of the, the kids, each one of my mother's kids, and they told us that they just tested it to see if what my mother had was hereditary. I said, you're working on her cells? And he said, yeah, he says her cells are still alive. And I just, you know how you, I was just truly amazed. And he said he'd been working on it for years. And it like took us by surprise. We never knew this. And there's another thing that got me upset with him, like, is there anything else I don't know? <laughs> and it can get scary when you think about it. I mean, how much of ourselves is out there, you know? The new technology of gene mapping gave geneticists a feeling of power and confidence. They became convinced that they would find the cause of cancer. They would open up the cell and isolate the cancer genes. And yet again, Hollywood became involved. The stars turned out to fund the scientists who offered a new promise. They would find the cancer genes and then repair or replace them. And cancer would be cured. What you're here to support tonight is something that is somewhat of a new approach to try and identify and understand the basic mechanisms that change, change a normal cell into a malignant cell. And then once we understand these mechanisms, to try and direct our therapy specifically at those alterations. Well, their view of the world is that if I knew the sequence of a gene, I would know what it does. And if I know what it does, then I'll be able to replace its faulty operation by giving it something else. And so people give them lots of money, they give them their faith, they believe in them, they hope in them, because they're going to save me by screwing around with your genes. And if cancer could be cured, one could make a great deal of money. The new biotechnology firms, which grew up in the 80s, seized on the promises being made by the scientists. The scientists said to the capitalists, we now have a technology that's going to enable us to cure cancer. And it was more than hope. It was a belief. And it fostered the biotechnology industry. I mean, if it was possible to conquer cancer, you're probably talking about the largest market in the world. And remember, all human beings are equal. There's almost no other products outside of bullets that work on all people equally. And so suddenly there was an opportunity to make a lot of money. They're profiting off of her while her family remains ignorant of all the things about her because they taken the cells and used it without permission. They have also distributed it without permission. Does she They're, belong to the family? And uh, oh. they also have research, you know. And one reason because this, this is a family matter. Thank you. Uh, okay. oh, sell, sell awesome. it to them. 5,000 Genetech. The Lax family began to learn more about what had been done with their mother's cells. They decided to approach lawyers to see if they could claim some of the money. I went to the lawyers because I wanted to find out what is happening with her cell. From my research, I found out that they're selling her cells all over the world. And I just wanted to find out who is making money off my mother's cells. I was kind of angry about it or mad about it in a way because it was something that no one knew, no one knew about. The lawyers approached most of the major biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies. 
everywhere they were turned away. It seemed they had no legal case. Henrietta Lacks had died too long ago. Faced by this, the Lacks family decided that if they couldn't win any money, they would fight for recognition for their mother. They began a campaign which was picked up by radical yeah. black magazines. And we got a lot of pictures of, of, around here like this, around the market, up John Hopkins Hospital. We just want to make them aware of who she was. The reason why I think they're not trying to acknowledge it is because she's black, I think it was the other way around. If she's a white female, I think they would have been knowledge and they, know, they would know who she is right now. The Lacks family became convinced that their mother's death somehow represented a kind of heroism. It had been a sacrifice by a black woman for the rest of the world. The most famous woman in the world in medical history, the only woman in the medical history that holds this title, you know, to me, I don't think they want blacks to hold that title. But the promise of finding a cure for cancer is yet again beginning to fade. By the early 90s, scientists had identified many genes associated with cancer. But these genes are only one part in a complicated sequence of events that lead to cancer. The human body is far more complicated than scientists thought. The public optimism is giving way to a new skepticism. We don't have a single case, not a single case, where a knowledge of the DNA sequence of a gene has led to a treatment for the disease. Knowing all the genes in the human genome is in itself not information on how the human body works. If you want to know how the human body works, you have to look at the proteins, the cell organelles, the machinery of the body as a whole. The DNA information is not sufficient. The dream didn't happen. The dream of winning the war on cancer the dream of making a lot of money did happen for a lot of people. The dream of finding ways to help some pa patients with cancer happened. But the dream to cure cancer has not and did not happen. Are we any nearer curing cancer than we were 50 years ago? No, certainly not. In particular cases, we are in better control of the conditions for chemical attacks on cancer, knowing exactly what chemicals to give. Lives are extended by either burning the cancer out or cutting it out or killing it with chemicals. And there are no other ways. And there are not likely to be. So is the promise of a genetic cure for cancer an illusion? Then? Yes. It really is? Yes. I don't know what more to say. <laughs> running, running, running. Morehouse College in Atlanta is one of the oldest black universities in America. If my mother don't go on, Last October, on the 45th anniversary of Henrietta Lacks's death, it honored her and her family. It was the culmination of their campaign for the recognition of their mother. The city of Atlanta acknowledges the contributions of Henrietta Lacks for advancing the medical and scientific efforts for cancer, polio, and many other diseases, and on behalf of the citizens of Atlanta, hereby proclaim October 11th as Henrietta Lacks Day in our city. Signed, William Campbell. The family now became celebrities. Would you give us some response on your, your emotional uh, comments at this time? Well, I, was, I think I was part of a miracle because when she was pregnant with me, she was dying with cancer. Oh. See, so I'm, so um, only little outcome I had of that, I stayed in the hospital a whole year with um, a spot of tuberculosis. Since then, um, I've been having a clean bill of health. And she had done, you know, tremendous, miraculous uh, help for other people, you know. She deserved it. You know. As a result of the campaign, Henrietta Lacks has become a scientific heroine. But in reality, she has defeated science. For 45 years, scientists have struggled to understand her cells and cure cancer. But a growing number of scientists believe that even if they understood why Henrietta's cells grow and divide ceaselessly, they could not cure the disease. 
there is a new pessimism in science. I can know the cause of lots of things. Uh, I know the cause of the tides, but I can't stop them. I know the cause of hurricanes, but I can't stop them. I know the current causes of death. And even if I can prevent some of the current causes of death, I cannot stop death. It's here to stay. All flesh is as the grass. Hela will live forever, perhaps. The dance of Hela continues. They are all dancing out there somewhere along the line, and they're still on the stage somewhere, I'm sure. The stage is very broad and, and wide, and the curtain has by no means gone down on them, and the music plays on. They're living elsewhere. They're still living out, out in, their in the test tubes. That's a miracle. 